Vande Guruna Chanaravinde. A brief look at the rich practical meaning associated with this mantra. I will recite the mantra, sing it, and then look a little bit into what it is invoking. Oh. So the first line of this verse tells us what the mantra is all about. And the first word is the verb that tells us the action. Vande is the first person singular of the root vand. And vand means to venerate, to extol, to praise, to salute. Okay, I am praising, I am saluting, I am venerating, I am approaching with a spirit and attitude of reverence, openness and gratitude. What? What am I saluting? What am I approaching in this open way? Next word is Guru Nam. Guru Nam means of the Gurus in the plural. Okay, so I am venerating, I'm extolling, I'm praising something that is of the Gurus. What might that be? Let's look further. Charanaravinde. Ah, I am saluting the lotus feet of the Gurus. So Aravinda means lotus, and the A ending tells us that this is in the dual number. Charana means foot, it can also mean root, but because we've got this dual ending, we understand I am saluting the lotus feet of the gurus. And the gurus is in the plural, so it's in the collective, the plurality of gurus, all of those gurus. Now, before we continue, what does Guru mean? Sometimes people use this word quite casually, but in Sanskrit, Guru is a heavy duty word because literally Guru means heavy. So the Guru is any person, place, experience, the influence of which is heavy duty enough to shift us from one state of awareness to a state of awareness that is vaster, that is greater, that allows us to see more clearly. Sometimes the Guru is described in the Indian tradition as that influence which leads us from the darkness of ignorance or partiality into the clearer insight of greater understanding. So this light of being able to see more clearly. And the Guru is described in a beautiful text called the Guru Gita as nothing other than the awakened conscience, nothing different from our awakened consciousness. So I'm saluting the lotus feet of the Gurus, of all of those people, places, things, experiences, which can help me expand my understanding of myself and the reality of existence. So. In this first line, it's very much invoking this attitude of reverence, this attitude of studentship. In the yoga tradition, there are two prerequisites for practice. One, to be born. Okay, here I am. And the second, to know that I do not know. If I think I've got it all worked out, then I'm probably going to block the possibility of new insights dawning. So when I approach the lotus feet of the gurus with that reverential attitude, that spirit of openness, then I'm making myself available to learn something new. 
So what a fantastic way to begin a yoga practice or a period of study. This mantra is often used to invoke this attitude and to pay homage to these great gurus of the yoga tradition at the beginning of practice. So I'm saluting not just my teacher and my teacher's teachers, but the whole collective intelligence of life and nature as my teacher as well. But of course, I'm also giving particular homage to those great masters of the yoga tradition who have given me the means to learn from all my experience by the way that the yoga teachings invite and encourage us to have this type of studentship attitude in the face of life and all its amazing gifts. So I'm saluting the lotus feet of the gurus. The lotus feet. Now there's a lot one can say here, but one thing I would like to say is that charana, the word for feet, also means root. A lotus grows from its roots. Where are its roots? In the earth and the water. Sometimes the lotus grows in a pond or in swampy land. Like us, as human beings, the lotus lives on the earth and water. Like us, it is something that grows from the earth and it grows towards the fire of the sun. It is caressed by the breeze and the air. And when it roots well and is nourished by the water of life and grows towards the sun and is nourished by the vital air of existence, then it can blossom open into space and reveal the deep, glorious beauty that it was carrying inside it all along. And this is the same idea for us as human beings. Deep inside, in the heart of all our selves, we carry the capacity as conscious sentient beings to recognize ourselves and incarnate fully the glory of our deeper selves as conscious beings. And this is what the gurus of the yoga tradition have taught us. This is, what, this is the gift they have bequeathed us, so we're giving gratitude for that. So first line, I salute the lotus feet of the gurus. Great. Now, there might come the question, why would I want to do that? What kind of gurus are they? So the second line is basically an adjective describing the lotus feet of those who we would like to salute. So it says, Sandarshita Svatma Sukhava Bodhi. Now notice the A ending. So this is basically agreeing grammatically with Charanaravinde. So the whole line is an adjective of the Guru's lotus feet. Sandarshita Svatma Sukhava Bodhi. So Sandarshita, they have seen well. What have they seen well? Svatma. Sva means self or one's own. Atma can also mean self in the sense of the true self or one soul. So they saw very well the depth, the essence of existence and their true selves. Sukhava Bodhi. So Ava Bodha means to come to an awareness of, to come to a recognizance of, to come to the sensibility of, to awake to the established recognition, understanding of something. So they came, they saw clearly Sandarshita, and they came to the deep, established, embodied understanding of their true selves. And how was that embodied understanding? Sukhava Bodhi. Sukham means literally good su and come space, good space, a space in which there is a good vibration a space in which there is harmony. So Sukham also means happy, easeful, agreeable. So these Gurus, they saw well the reality of existence, of themselves. They came to full self-realization. And how was that realization? How was that awakening? It was Sukham. It was most agreeable. Now this line is also very interesting because Sandarshita, this is from the root Drish, the root to see which gives us words, for example, like darshana, 
a perspective. Yoga is a darshan, it's a perspective, it's a way of looking at, engaging with reality. And yoga recognizes that as a human being, often our darshana, our perspective, our way of looking, can get limited and veiled by our conditioned ideas. But this sandarshita, this is also carrying in the Sanskrit the sense that not only did these gurus see well themselves, but they were then able to act, as it were, as causative agents for others to see well too. So with their example, with their teachings, with what they embodied, they didn't just come to self-realization, but they were then also able to act and teach and bless in ways that help others come to that realization. So already we see, well, there's lots of good reasons for me if I'm interested in self-realization, if I'm interested in coming to a more sustainably easeful state of recognizing the reality of existence. Yes, it's well worth venerating these Guru's lotus feet. Third line continues the description of why we are venerating these Gurus. Nishreyasi means they cannot be surpassed. They're not just teaching me how to do some particular thing. These Gurus are the ones who are inviting me along my own path of discovery to the ultimate aim of existence as a human being. So they're unsurpassable. They're inviting me to go all the way to that wholeness, that fullness, that completion, that deep satisfaction. Jangali ka yamani. Now jangali ka yamani, again the A endings, this is further describing those, those gurus whose lotus feet we are venerating. The English word jungle, jangali, notice the correspondence here. So sometimes this is described as these gurus who act as it were like a jungle physician, like a jungle healer, like a shaman or medicine man who lives kind of outside the precincts of civilization in the um, wild lands, in the jungle, in the um, arid mountains or the dense jungle that hasn't been cultivated. As such, the medicine man, the shaman, the jungle physician, the jungle healer who lives in this place, such a healer has that deep understanding of the forces and power of nature and is able to work with them skillfully and respectfully to help cultivate yoga and harmony here in the reality of a human existence on this planet with all of its comings and goings and ups and downs. The Kalyamana refers to that place where the um, jungle physician might reside. But this word is very interesting because Jangali Kalyamana can also connote the idea of the expert snake charmer. So the Jangali Kai is though also the one who knows how to charm a snake. And this is a very um, interlinked idea with the jungle physician. This is something that we find with Sanskrit words. Sanskrit means well made, well done. So in this mantra we have many well made words, words that by themselves pack in so much rich meaning. But when these words that pack in so much rich meaning are juxtaposed close to one another, they play off each other and bring out all of these other rich associations. So these gurus, they're unsurpassable, they act like great healers in the jungle of existence. They know how to work with the comings and goings, the realities of life, to actually bring us to a state of true health and real wholeness and balance and integration. And as they do that, they also act like expert snake charmers. Now, in yoga, just like lotus, snake is a very recurring symbol of great importance. Lord Shiva, who is also known as Yogishwara, the Lord of Yogins, sometimes when he is depicted as Yogishwara, he is adorned with snakes and he may have the king cobra around his neck as his garland. And this symbolizes a similar idea to these jungle physicians. 
Lord Shiva, when he wears this snake around his neck, how is the king cobra? What a majestic creature. It's dark scales, maybe iridescent, and in them we can see reflected all the variegated beauty and colors of the spectrum of life. And if you see a king cobra in the sunlight, for example, moving in this very graceful way, it can be quite intoxicating, quite beguiling, quite compelling, quite mesmerizing. And this is like the beauty of existence, the beauty of worldly life. It's got so many shades, so many colors, so many possibilities, so much infinite variety. We can get lost in it. Now, how else is the King Cobra, as well as being very beautiful, <laughs> contains deadly poison, can also be very dangerous. And so this is also said to be like the world. It is full of beauty. But if we are complacent, then the beauty of the world, all these comings and goings, we can get lost in that. We can get caught up in the miasma. We can get mesmerized and veiled and shrouded as our awareness gets pulled here and there and somewhat confused. But Lord Shiva, Yogeshwara, the Lord of Yoga, he knows how to make the beauty of existence his adornment. He knows how to celebrate it and enjoy it without getting trapped, enmeshed, bound or poisoned by it. And so Jangali Kayamani has this sense as well. These yogic masters, these gurus who we are venerating, they are teaching us how to move gracefully in the world, how to move skillfully in the world, in dynamic equilibrium, working with our nature, working with the rhythms of life respectfully, sustainably, in ways that help us and help the collective evolve into that recognition of our deeper selves. So, lots more good reasons why I want to orient towards these gurus with reverence. Then the last line does two things at once, which is some, well, does many things at once, but two of the things it does at once in classic Sanskrit style, it further talks about why these gurus' lotus feet are worth extolling. So it's further describing the gurus, but it's also telling us for what purpose we are praising and venerating them, why we are orienting towards them with this spirit of devotion, with this spirit of reverence. Samsara halahala mohashantyai. So notice that the ending of the word here is different. We've had e, e, e. Now we have shantyai. And this is in the dative case, which means to or for. So this means for the purpose of. So why are we venerating these gurus? For the purpose of what? Shantyai, shanti. For the purpose of pacifying. Pacifying, harmonizing what? Moha, the delusion. What type of delusion? Halahala of the potentially deadly poison, samsara, of worldly existence. So this idea that we just mentioned with regard to the, snake, the expert snake charmer. So we are venerating these gurus who, through their own deep understandings, have been able to give teachings that help others come to that established understanding of the true self. These unsurpassable gurus who act like a great healer who can help us bring harmony and wholeness into the reality of life, we orient towards that energy with openness and gratitude, with the intention of freeing ourselves from the potential poison, miasma, and confusion and delusion that is part and parcel of worldly existence. When things are always changing, it's easy to get beguiled and confused. And so we orient towards that energy that brings harmony and clear sight and understanding and can help us come out of partiality and into wholeness and true understanding. And so this is why we vande, we, why I vande, why I venerate the lotus feet of the gurus. So I think it's such a beautiful mantra to begin 
a yoga practice. And I hope that if you do work with this mantra, or you'd like to work with this mantra, this brief introduction to some of the riches encoded in its meaning is helpful. Thank you.